This is Psych Boost helping you with your psychology qualification, one video at a time. This video is on neuropsychology, and in this 17th video, we'll be covering the structures and function of the nervous system. The very kind support of students and teachers who donate on Patreon help me help you by continuing to make these videos and resources. Very big thank you for your help, guys, so join them for the link. For everyone, you might want to check out the free worksheet for this video and the quiz. Here are the terms on the AQA GCSE specification we're going to cover in this video. As you go through the video, they'll be in red text and you need to be able to respond to questions on all of this. So let's start by dividing out the human nervous system, the web of nerves that run throughout your body. The central nervous system, or CNS, is where information is processed. And it contains, of course, the brain, where complex processing takes place, but also the spinal cord that transmits information between the brain and the rest of your nervous system. The rest of your nervous system is the peripheral nervous system, or PNS. It's constructed of a network of messenger neurons, either sensory for bringing information to the brain or motor from the brain back out to the body. The somatic nervous system, or SNS, is what we use when we decide to perform an action. So if you pick up an apple, you're using your somatic system to coordinate your muscles. We call this a voluntary system, as it's under conscious control. You decided to move or to not. What's not voluntary is the autonomic nervous system, or ANS. This is a network of nerves that controls your internal organs and glands. So things like releasing hormones. You can't consciously decide to do those things, so the ANS is an involuntary system. And we break the ANS down into two opposite branches, sympathetic and parasympathetic. The sympathetic branch activates in a stress response, so during fight or flight. And the sympathetic branch wants to increase bodily activity needed for immediate survival, so increasing heart rate, breathing rate, and sweating. But it will slow the activity of processes not needed for immediate survival, like digestion. The opposite parasympathetic branch is activated as a rest response, decreasing those bodily processes and allowing the body to digest food. And normally there's a balance between these two branches called homeostasis. But as I said, the sympathetic branch activates in the fight or flight response, and that's something we need to focus on. So, the brain detects a threat. An area of the brain called the hypothalamus is the area that decides that a threat has been detected, and it will trigger the sympathetic branch of the ANS. That will cause a hormonal response with adrenaline and noradrenaline released into the bloodstream from a gland just above your kidneys called the adrenal glands. The hormones in your blood will now cause the biological processes to change, increasing that heart rate and breathing rate, but also slowing digestive and immune systems. This allows the body to use all of its resources for immediate survival. There's also psychological changes in the fight or flight response, a feeling of panic and high alertness. But when the threat's passed, the body will return to rest. Now when you think of emotion, you likely think that an emotion is a direct response to something bad happening. There's an interesting theory of emotion called the James Lang theory that says something very different about the cause of emotion. The theory suggests that it's actually the physiological changes in our body that causes the emotions. So if I was to draw this out as a diagram, we would have the event followed by a biological response and then your brain's interpretation of what that physiological response means, and then the emotion. So in other words, instead of feeling sad because of a negative event and then crying because you're sad, you would actually cry first and then interpret the crying as sadness. Or to link this to the fight or flight response. You see a tiger, your heart rate rushes, you shake and you sweat, and then you interpret all of that as fear. It's an interesting point. And if you spotted a tiger and you didn't have any of the physiological changes in your body, you would probably say that you weren't afraid. So if we can remove the physical changes that are linked to an emotion, the theory suggests we just remove the emotion. And this is possible according to the James Lang theory because each emotion has a distinct pattern of physiological responses. Now the theory does seem to be able to explain how emotions can be controlled by trying to control our physical responses. And it would make sense from an evolutionary perspective that with a quick response being a matter of life or death, it would make sense for the body to change first, not waiting for a threat to be thought about emotionally. But 
there are a range of similar body responses to very different emotions. Two examples are fear and attraction. Both can have a quick heart rate and sweating, but they're very different emotions. The theory struggles to explain how our brains decide on which emotions to feel. There are also a wide range of other models of emotion that seem to have a higher face validity, as in they seem to make more sense. The canon barred theory, for example, suggests that the physical and emotional response happen at the same time, but separately. Also, the James Lang theory is simplistic, treating all emotions as a result of interpreting biological responses. Neuroscience research suggests that different emotions are processed in very different ways. Brain scans show that complex emotions are processed slowly and deeply across the brain, while simple emotions like fear travel directly to the amygdala, avoiding the cortex for a quick response. So, now we've covered that content, of course you need to be able to use all that information to actually answer those questions. Here are five questions I've made to test your skills. So, pause the video and give them a go. For those of you who support me on Patreon, I've put together an additional bonus video showing you how to answer these properly. For everybody else, thanks for watching, liking, subscribing, and I'll see you on the next video in neuropsychology, neuron structure and function.